welcome you this morning to uh, Christ Concord. You may be seated. We want to thank you for coming, whether you are here in person or whether you're with us online. Uh, we welcome you here, and we're so glad to have you here this morning. There are a few announcements that we have. Um, first, we want to call your attention to the bulletin. Uh, we have uh, the blood drive on December the 3rd, of course. And you can register online. Um, we also are having the poncettas uh, that we're going to have placed in the beautiful church here. You can go online and also order some of those for $15 each. On Thursday, I mean Wednesday, will be um, our new, I mean Thanksgiving Eve. I'm already in the new year. Our Thanksgiving Eve <laughs> uh, worship service it's going to be at Providence. I have a sign-in sheet over there. If you are not willing to drive because of the traffic and all the other things, and uh, we will have the church bus that will come and bring you and, and bring you back. Uh, but if you're interested in that, you need to sign in on the sign-in sheet. Now, I do have to have a number of people who are interested in order to bring the bus here. And uh, Ralph has already agreed to drive the bus. I will be bringing the message so I won't be able to drive the bus as I had announced earlier. Okay, so if you are interested in that, make sure you sign in on the sign-in sheet so that we can get that uh, determined. Today at the church, we will be meeting uh, very briefly uh, for all of the members that are here. Uh, we're going to talk about things moving forward. Amen? Amen. All right, good. So. We're starting our sermon series. We've been talking about triggers. And as we've been getting into the different types of triggers, <clears throat> we are finding that um, there are things that God do require us to do. But in the midst of us doing the things that he's required of us, if we could only remember 
all that he's done for us, it will be so easy. However, there are so many times where we miss the mark. So let us make our confession today in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. Loving God, we often seek your own way instead of yours. We look after our own needs instead of the needs of our loved ones. We love become conditional and based on our own convenience. We let selfishness and hurt fester for the sake of being right. Help us to heal the rifts in our relationships and to love in the unconditional way. Amen. Hallelujah. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. By his authority, I therefore declare unto all of you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us share Christ's peace with one another.
be seated. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you for allowing us an opportunity to enter into your house once again. We come today, Lord, with open hearts, asking you to come in and fill our spirit asking you to come in and show us the way, asking you to help us through your word, through your spirit, to become the people that you've asked us to be. There are things that we would like to do to glorify you, to magnify you, and make your name known throughout the earth. Teach us these things and help us to know your ways. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. All right, our lesson today is coming from Ephesians 5th chapter, the 22nd verse. Wives, be sub subject to your own husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word, so as to be present the church to himself, to, as to present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own body, 
but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and he and a wife should respect her husband. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from the world and go into the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon, a Kazarid, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had, had come to come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have, no, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but it is extremely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was, going to, who was to betray him. For his reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I say to you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but, is, but it's entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. You may be seated. Amen. We, we, we've been having this sermon series, and uh, this week is a real good trigger. And um, so we want to start the sermon off today by watching a video of something that some of you might remember and some of you who are younger may be just introduced to. Let's watch this video. Oh, <laughs> online. If, online, you may not be able to see it, but you'll be able to hear it. I suppose you didn't have time to sew these either, huh? They didn't sew the socks. I know why you haven't got an excuse, Alice. You're afraid to give me an excuse. Because you know that I know that you know that I know what you've been doing around here all day. Sitting there fooling around. You know, something right after you left the house this morning, I got in one of those silly moods of mine. You know how I get sometimes? 
So just for laughs, I thought, well, I'll do the breakfast dishes and make the bed and take the garbage down. Then when I came back up, I was still in such a funny mood, you know, I thought, why should I settle down to the drudgery of mending your socks? So I scrubbed the kitchen floor. <laughs> then, you know something? I was still so giddy and so gay over this whole thing that I thought I'd really enjoy myself, so I washed all the windows. <laughs> Then, Ralph, I went out and I did the marketing, and I came back with a pot roast, and I put the pot roast on the stove, and while it was cooking, I went in and I cleaned out the bedroom closet. Now, I know that this may sound like work to you, Ralph, but it isn't. It's fun. <laughs> it's such good sport. <laughs> Do you know why it's such good sport, Ralph? Because I'm so loaded with modern conveniences. <laughs> Just loaded steam irons and vacuum cleaners and dishwashers and washing machines and say nothing of this lovely new modern refrigerator over here. Oh, that reminds me, it's time to defrost it. <laughs> that will give you a rough idea, Ralph, of what a joy it is working around this apartment all day. You know why? Because it's so up to date. I am the only girl in town with an atomic kitchen. This place looks like Yucca Flats after the blast. Oh, so some of you remember that, right? Yeah. Uh, so some of you are like, oh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> well, that is a sitcom from 1955. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't born yet. Uh, few years later. Uh, so it's called The Honeymooners. And, and basically what is happening here, uh, Ralph and Alice Cramden, their husband and wife, and uh, Alice is using sarcasm and humor to surreptitiously let Ralph know that he is not the boss of her. All right. And uh, so, but did you hear all those things she had to do in one day? All those things she's rattled off? 1955. All right. So that, that was the 1955 standard. Now let's compare that to the 2023 standard. Anybody doing all that anymore? Everybody's quiet. All right. Good. All right. Some will say that we have come a long way. And yet, when we see or hear this scripture, anytime it's quoted, it still is a trigger. And the trigger is this scripture right here. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And as we were reading that, some of you, and you didn't say anything because you were in the church, uh, but some of your faces went, mm hmm. <laughs> because it's a trigger. And it's been triggering people for a long time. So I want to start the sermon off today just asking a simple question. How? Do you read a letter? Think about your answer. How do you read a letter? All right, so in other words, uh, if someone wrote you a letter, it would be right for them to assume that you would read the whole letter, right? Okay. Uh, but let's say uh, somehow you skip the first page and you go straight to the middle of the letter. And right in the middle of the letter, you find a disturbing sentence that doesn't make sense because you didn't read the beginning of the letter. But you go on reading the letter. So you read the rest of the letter with a misunderstanding of the original intent of the person who wrote the letter. In other words, you start to draw your own conclusion on what the writer meant by this disturbing sentence that got your attention because you read from the middle, all right? What I'm getting at here is that the book of Ephesians is a letter that Paul is writing to clarify some issues that are going on with Christians during that particular time. Now, there are only six chapters in this letter. However, our triggers... Scripture is found in the fifth chapter, which means that we have gone past the middle of the letter 
And now we're going toward the end of the letter, and we got this disturbing sentence, wives, submit yourselves to your own husband, that triggers people. All right? So what we can do um, is we can continue to um, draw our own conclusions and try to figure out why we are triggered the way we are triggered and how to deal with our triggers. Or we can read from the beginning of the letter to get a better understanding of what Paul meant. So that means we'll have to read chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. So let's get started. No, I'm not going to read all of that. (laughs) I am not reading all of that. However, I have read it so that I can give you an understanding of what took place leading up to that one sentence that's getting everyone's attention. So, basically, um, in the beginning of the letter, Paul spends a lot of time convincing us of the great blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. That's what he's telling us about. And how we are lifted up and blessed in every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Helping us to see that we are a part of Christ's eternal plan. Most of the letter is telling us about what God has done for us. And he's done a lot of things for us. Mighty things, great things. Then toward the middle of the letter, it starts to talk about what we should do as Christians. And this is when it starts getting a little touchy. We're okay about what all that he has done. But when it comes to the time of him explaining the things we need to do, that's when we start getting the problems. All right? So when we get to that particular part, um, what Paul is doing is he is making the statement in a way that you will understand that he's talking to Christians. So when we begin to look at what we must do, we must remember all that God has done. All right? Keeping that in mind. When Paul gets to the part talking about what we must do, he does so by describing it in a form of walking in the light. So Paul said, if you're walking, if you're walking in the light, then he gives some some aspects of walking in the light. So if you're walking in the light, then you are being filled with the Holy, with the Spirit. So if you are being filled with the Spirit and you are filled with the Spirit, now he's drawing a line. All right? Because... The letter was not to everyone. It was to the Christians that were having issues. All right? So Paul is now saying, if you are filled with the Spirit, these are the kinds of things that should be happening in your life as a Christian. Number one thing, he said, if you are filled with the Spirit, we should be living a life of praise and adoration to God. You know, making melody in your heart, singing songs and spiritual songs. Yeah. That should be happening if we're filled with the Spirit. Then he goes on in verse 21. Now, we skipped over that verse, but verse 21 is a very important verse. Because in verse 21, he says, if you're filled with the Spirit, then submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh Uh-oh. Thank you. 
because no one wants to willingly submit to a tyrant. No one wants to willingly submit to a dictator. No one wants to willingly submit to someone who's going to beat them or control them. During this time, the tradition was a boy would be in the womb and say, well, there it is. It's a little different. Because you see, he was a boy. Uh, yes, we had to obey his parents. Yes, we had to be uh, respectful to his elders. And yes, we had to be somewhat submissive because he was a child. But when the boy became a man, he was given the same authority as all Cleansing her by the washing with the word through the through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Wow! Now I I have always been intrigued with the fact that that's all in one sentence. That whole order is in one sentence. Now when we look at that. It's like, well, why is this not a trigger for the guy? <laughs> I tell you why it's not a trigger for the guy. Because they are stuck on the other scripture. The one that says submit. Why submit yourself to, to your own husband? They stuck there. Because it's to their favor. If I can just keep you from seeing that the rest of the, the scriptures that the Lord had for me to do, then all I got to do is have you doing it. No! The work is on the man. Men have got work to do to make this thing work. It is not easy. Alright? So, so basically what I'm saying here is Paul was not giving men authority to rule over women. He placed the greatest responsibility of the marriage on the man. To love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself in order, in, uh, I mean in other words, what I'm trying to say here is that a man should love his wife so much 
that he would be willing to give his life for his wife. That's what we're building. That's what Paul was setting in place. See, that wasn't happening back then. But Paul was drawing a line. That's how much you're supposed to love your wife as Christ loved the church. So men, we have an awesome responsibility to love our wives. Uh, we have so much to do and we have so much to give as we work together in this family team with our wives. Now, I proposed to my wife in 1989. Well, actually, 88. And we planned to actually get married in 1989. Uh, June 19th was going to be our wedding. Excuse me. And what happened was, I don't want the kids say it in school, see what had happened was, uh, we were having a marital counseling, premarital counseling, and I do suggest that if you're going to get married, that you get counseling before you get married. And uh, while we were in counseling session, um, there was a question that was asked, and, and, and the question was, explain your life priorities. And I said, this is what I started out first, I said, Okay, it's God, this is me speaking, then it's Willie, and then it's Jennifer. Jennifer spoke up in the nice little quiet voice, and she said, for her it was God, then Willie, then Jennifer. And I said, oh my God. Now, with that scripture, with that scripture we just read about the husband, and with those words coming out of her mouth, it's like, it's like they cut like a knife in my spirit. And I realized something, and I said it out kind of loud. I am not there yet. I'm not there. I was honest. I'm not there. So we postponed the, the June 19th uh, wedding, and I took some time figuring out what I needed to do in my relationship with God that would change that whole concept of laying my own interest before hers. But that was, the, that was the deal. So that I could get to a point where I could really, truly love her as Christ loved the church. And we did reschedule. And of course, we got married about six months later when I finally got things together on April the 21st, 1990. And glory to God, we have been married now for 33 wonderful years. And I can say we are happily married for 33 wonderful years. But if, if I had not taken the time to get that understanding of what it means to love my wife as Christ loved the church, I don't know. Who knows? But I'm so glad that I did. So, in other words, what I'm saying here is Paul is writing this letter to Christians. So, if you are a Christian, these are the people he was talking to. Walking in the light. Walking in the spirit. If you are spirit-filled, spirit then you won't have a problem with submitting. If you are spirit-filled, you won't have a problem with loving. But when Paul was talking to the husband and he was saying, love your wives. It went far beyond, and I really have realized this in my marriage, it goes far beyond the eros. You know, the erotic love driven by desire. It goes far above that phileo, uh, the fondness love driven by a common interest. Paul is speaking about the agape love. Now, that's a higher kind of love. And it is a love more of decision, a matter of the mind, because it chooses to love. It doesn't have much to do with feelings. It's all about decision. So in essence, if we paraphrase what Paul was saying, we could say it like this. Husbands, daily decide to practice self-denial for the sake of your wife. Which leads us into our next. Scripture. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now that's a reflection of Genesis 
us, whereas the first man and the first woman were one. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. God joined them together. Now, when you become a husband, you become a new creature. You become something new. See, they were familiar with who you were as a single man, but when you become married, you become a whole different person. And the same thing happens with a woman. They remember you when you were single, but when you become married, you become a whole different person because the two of you will become one. It's a mystery, I know, but that's exactly what happens. So, so that, therefore, there has to be um, something new is going to happen. So if something new is going to happen, you have to let go of something. So you must, be, you must leave the former associations. You must leave those former traditions. Yes, you're going to hold on to some things. But some of those things you got to let go of. And you got to leave some of those generational curses and things that are tied to your family so that you can cleave to your wife or your husband to the godly order and the holy calling of becoming one. See, this is God-ordained marriage. It's, it's, it's something that God has ordained. All right, so Paul teaches about marriage. And God's pattern for marriage is Jesus and the church. That's the pattern. Remember, all that Jesus did to make this possible. Now, Jesus was always willing to go the extra mile for the church. Even on the night before he was betrayed, he kneeled at the feet of the disciples and, they, and he washed their feet. He taught us how to love. He taught us how to serve. His obedience to the cross is what ushered in this example of submitting, this example of loving at the level that he has it at right now. Placing family teamwork and unity at the forefront so that the husband can be able to let unity shape his thinking, to let unity as a team to shape his actions so that the wives can respect their husband. So ultimately, God has set the order of marriage in place. And if we follow the order of God, then God will order our steps in helping us to walk together in unity, to walk together in equality, submitting to one another, and to help us to walk together in love. Amen.
stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you work even when I don't feel it you work it you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you working even when I don't know when you working you never stop you never stop Let us continue in our offering that we brought before the Lord.
he's a liar. <laughs> he has no rule over here. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so grateful for who you are. The mighty things you have done for us, Lord. So many things, we cannot name them all. We're so grateful for your goodness and mercy. We're so grateful that we can come to you today as our healer, that we can come to you today as our comforter, that we can come to you today as our peace, and that we will find grace and mercy, Lord God, to meet us wherever we are, in whatever we are dealing with. You will provide the answer, and we're so grateful for that, Lord. And we give you praise for it right now in Jesus' name. And Father, we just lift up right now our country, the leaders of our country, and we still lift up Israel and Hamas. May you bring peace in that situation. Father, as we are moving forward in this church, we ask that you would begin to lead and guide us in the direction that you want us to go, that you will be glorified and magnified here. And everything that will be done will be done to the glory of your name. And Father, these names now we lift up to you. For those who are in need of your, your help, your strength, your peace, your love, your healing, your grace. Miriam, Helen, Christy, Al, Mickey, Christian and Tucker for the birth of their daughter. The Fisher family on the death of Pastor Call. And in hospice we have Roberta. And all the other names that we name out now, either loud now or silently. Lord, we commit them all to your hands, all that we have lifted up to you today. Thank you for providing the answer, and granting us your peace and love. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which was shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us now pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom in the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This table is open to all who believe and all who have been baptized. Come and dine.
The body of blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you in his grace now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Let's stand together. I searched the world, it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along, you put me back together.
Jesus, the name of our 